then we would all get together and see what counterproposals we might suggest that would make them think twice. We have three questions, uh, all of them asking you to weigh in on the issue of military spending and what situation we would be in economically if we could do away with most of it. It's an interesting question. It has both a, an obvious and a, a little more complicated answer. Obviously, we are currently fighting, depending on exactly how you count, two or three wars. I, I don't know whether Pakistan counts as a third one or part of the second one or, or whatever. It's an enormous amount of money. You should, however, be aware that most of that money stays here. That is, we talk about paying for a war over there, but it's mostly payment to American companies that make all of the equipment, to Americans who make all of the stuff that's used there, to American soldiers, to American private armies, which are now a major factor in these wars. Uh, so a great deal of that money is, in fact, what economists call military Keynesianism. In other words, it's government spending to pump up the economy, but it, the spending, instead of being on roads and harbors and schools and old age facilities and, and children and so is for military activity. But it is a way of stimulating our economy. So if you separate that question, you could say, well, there are plenty of other ways we could stimulate the economy. We don't need to have the war do that. It is an open question whether what our economy would look like if you mean stop spending on the war, end of story. This economy is heavily dependent on the support and stimulus it gets by these war expenditures since the overwhelming bulk of that money stays right here. We would have to figure out an alternative way for that kind of support since there's no evidence that the private economy can sustain even the level of, of limping along economy that we have now. Another way to say it, very briefly. Please note with me, the United States government is still the owner of the General Motors Corporation and of the AIG Corporation, and in effect of all of our major banks. We haven't privatized again. We have nationalized, we have socialized those enterprises because they cannot function yet without it. That's a sign of how serious this situation is, and the government is going to continue to look for any conceivable way to keep pumping up that economy, and the war is just a, a politically convenient, so long as there isn't an anti-war movement. If there were one, then they would have to find, and they would find, an alternative expenditure to keep the economy going without a war. But for so long as they believe the political support is there for the war, then that's a nice way of, if you pardon the expression, killing two birds with one, with one stone. I have a number of questions about the role of the labor movement. One questioner says, much of the progress in wages and working conditions from the 30s to the 70s is attributable to labor organizing and militancy, not just labor shortage. And all the questions end in some version of what will it take to get the labor movement into gear again? Okay, yeah, it's, it's a good correction of what I presented to remind us all, and that's quite right, that it wasn't just a labor shortage, that there was also the need for the labor movement to organize and struggle and fight very hard for many of the benefits that the working class got. That's, that's crystal clear the case. As to what it will take to get the labor movement uh, going, I, I am, I don't mind admitting it, in somewhat of a despair about our labor movement. It has been declining for, for 50 years, almost in a straight line down in terms of membership and of political clout. Um, its leaders, as best I can tell, have learned little or nothing over this 50-year period. They don't change their fundamental orientation. I mean, there are exceptions, of course, but in general, they, they keep doing what they're doing. I understand they're working under very difficult circumstances, but it's a process of decline that makes you think that if you were in charge or you were a, a militant or an activist in the labor movement, at the very least, you ought to be having fundamental discussions 
about what you're not doing right that is contributing, not that you're the, the unions are themselves the sole explanation for their decline, that's not true, they face a very hostile environment and that's serious, but you can't change much of that. What you can change is your own organizational life the unions have, don't agree with what I just said. They still believe that, that lobbying and mo moving at the level of, of the legislatures and the federal government is their only and major hope. That's where they spend the bulk of their effort and their money and their staffs. Uh, I don't see it working, but they are fearful of, of achieving even less if they don't do it. But having said all of that, there are a couple of signs of something. And here's the one that I'm most excited about, even though I understand it hasn't gone very far. I believe it was about a year ago, maybe a bit more, that one of our largest unions, United Steelworkers of America, made a remarkable decision, different from any that I know the American labor movement had made before. They entered into a formal agreement, which they announced, with something called the Mondragon communities in the north of Spain. Now let me tell you briefly, for those of you that may not be familiar, a little over 50 years ago, a Catholic priest in the Catalan area in the north of Spain, just below the Pyrenees Mountains, began a program to deal with unemployment in that region, which is an endemic problem, in which, apropos of what I said earlier, workers would own and operate their own enterprises collectively. No capitalist structure, no top-down hierarchy, no board of directors, no shareholders. The workers themselves would do it. And here we are roughly 50 years later. I believe the numbers are now about 100,000 workers are members of the Mondragon communities producing an immense array of goods across an immense array of enterprises. Um, they solved the problem of labor not by driving a better bargain with an employer through collective bargaining, the American approach, but rather by a radical reorganization of production of the sort that I was pointing at at the end of my talk. And it, the, it's amazing that an American trade union basically put out a statement saying, we now need to think of a kind of two-track approach. On the one hand, where it's appropriate, we'll continue to represent workers in bargaining with employers for better wages and working conditions. But on the other hand, we are allying with Mondragon to begin to explore in the United States a labor movement that would begin to push for, to work with, to organize workers to take over and run their own enterprises. And for those of you that may have seen Naomi Klein and her husband's film, The Take, about the workers who took over the factories in Argentina, it's the beginning of a sense, wow, maybe what the program of a left in America would be for unemployment today is not just that the federal government would hire, but here's what a left would say. It should hire, but in enterprises that those workers themselves would operate and collectively run. So that for the American people, an unemployment program would also give a second, even more important benefit. Americans would for the first time have real freedom of choice to work in a top-down capitalist enterprise or in a collectively run enterprise by workers on their own. And we as consumers would have a parallel choice. We could buy the products produced by a capitalist enterprise or with the same spirit that now drives some of us to buy fair traded coffee, we would buy commodities that would have written into the sleeve of the jacket not just the country where it was made, but whether it was a capitalist or a communitarian, I'm avoiding that scary word, uh, enterprise <laughs> that we wanted to support with our purchasing dollars. That's an interesting recognition by a major American university that a radical change in what it means to be a labor organizer is maybe beginning to sprout. And that I would take to be very hopeful. You've described basically a long process through which the people running America's largest corporations in undermining the wages of their workers have undermined the capacity of the American consumer to absorb their products. Now, we have several questions asking, 
why you think these corporations have willingly taken actions that then threw them into crisis. It certainly wasn't a given three years ago that they'd be bailed out the way they were. That's a very important question because nothing I say should be interpreted, and I will be really upset if I think that some of you are in inferring or that I have done anything to suggest that anything about our economic system is under control. It is not under control. And let me give you some examples and then I'll get to, to the specific question. When George Bush faced his second term, he and the Republicans understood that the worst possible thing to do in terms of the chances of a Republican replacing George Bush for the next presidency would be to have an economic crisis happen in the last year of his presidency. That is the worst. And he assembled the best economics advisors he could find. Larry Summers type people. <laughs> you know, with all the pedigrees one could ask and he assembled them and he gave them resources and power and influence. Everything. Complete failure. They had a collapse in the last year, and he was blown out of the, and with him the Republicans were blown out. That lesson was not lost on Mr. Obama. He assembled the best economic <laughs> advisor he could, and Larry Summers and everybody who had ever worked or even looked at Mr. Clinton uh, was assembled there in the White House to make sure, because the last thing on earth he would want for his agenda is the, uh, so he has 10% unemployment going into the midterm elections, and he is effectively damaged badly in the political outcome. So much for having it under control. Best minds imaginable, best measurements, I mean, economy in a bleh. Right? General Motors, let's take a private example. 